testosterone replacement therapy, which is really where you're taking a guy who's got erectile dysfunction, low libido, poor memory, and is just feeling horrible, low mood. Mm -hmm. um, and you're essentially just giving him a hormone that's going to help him feel normal again and yeah. that's going to help him get his marriage back on track and mm -hmm. help him be able to perform at work. Or It's an area that I've become... A really begun to love more and more and just watching guys the awesome things that they go out and achieve once they've just been given a little nudge and they then go out and you know make some pretty amazing changes in their lives it's really cool to see and we yeah. do know that the average testosterone levels in men is dropping at between one and two percent a year from the age of 30 um, essentially now some people become uh, symptomatic with that so it can impact uh, mood um, and is often misdiagnosed as depression anxiety um, and I think it often doesn't get picked up on and guys can get put on various host of antidepressants for years and years before it gets picked up if mm. at all I want people to walk out of the room going this could be it Mm, this could, could be, yeah, yeah, this is, is like, it sounds cheesy, but this could be the beginning of the rest of your life where actually shit gets better, a lot better. All right. Shall we attempt the introduction? <laughs> My favourite part. All right. All right. I'm Welcome. excited. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be, I'll cock it up. Okay. This is, I, I do it, he doesn't. I refuse to. Uh, Neither of us like doing it. I've just got a little... Slightly bigger balls, I think. No, I think it's that you said I want to do an intro, and I said no. I, I think would I, never do an intro. I said, I think, <laughs> Are you not to be trusted? Is that what the point yeah. is here? I, I just couldn't. I, I just feel so awkward. I, yeah. 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 I, I feel awkward inside. But right. It's fine. You just hide it. That's a good job. Hide it. That's a good job. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. On that note. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today we're talking about male testosterone deficiency. It's linked to mental health and how it can be treated. Today's guest is Dr. An Dr. Angela Service. Um, Angela is a GP with a specialist interest in men's health, spent 17 years in the British Army, and is the founder and medical director of Eden Health for Men. How are you? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. Good. Very, very happy to have you. Um, we've talked loads about this being a topic that we've wanted to cover for ages. Um, I think it's one that's massively underserved um, and one that I think the NHS deal with very badly. Yeah, there's certainly some room for improvement. And I think generally, uh, you know, it's a really good opportunity to be here and hopefully be getting guys talking about it and getting them interested in it. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, you know, we're aware of what testosterone is and why it's important, but some of our audience may not be. So that, let's start there. So can you tell us what testosterone is, what it does, why it's important? Yep. So um, testosterone is a hormone uh, that is common to men and women. Um, it's uh, present in much larger uh, levels in men. Um, and when we when men have a deficiency in testosterone, it can cause a particular um, group of symptoms. They're all pretty vague. And testosterone deficiency often for men uh, comes about over a really protracted period of time um, and can be quite insidious really in, in its onset. Um, and it can, I think one of the th first things that you pointed out was it can impact uh, mood um, and is often misdiagnosed as depression, anxiety um, and I think it often doesn't get picked up on and guys can get put on various host of antidepressants for years and years before it gets picked up, if mm. at all. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And you see it a lot now with um, obviously the female menopause where historically that's been the same, isn't it? Where you've you know, had a lot of females mistreated or misdiagnosed for depression mm. when it was actually a hormone deficiency or an imbalance. And I think, you know, that's got, getting a lot of traction now, but I feel like testosterone, which to some extent is, I guess, is can be a, a male menopause of sorts, maybe isn't getting as much, you know, attention. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's been really fantastic for women's health um, of late. There's been a lot going on in the media, which has been really, really good. Um, and sometimes when the media decide to roll with something, it, it does, it can do real good things for, uh, f particularly in the health sphere. Uh, and I think that's been fantastic for women's health. It really has. Um, women 
as a general rule as well, have much more touch points within the healthcare services throughout their lives. So uh, they will talk to the GP about periods, they'll talk about contraception, they will talk about, um, you know, it will be smears, breast checks, uh, it will then be pre and postnatal care as well. Um, and so they have a lot more touch points throughout their lives, whereas men don't really have that many moving forward at all. Sometimes, depending on what your employers are like, you might get a 40s health check. Um, but apart from that, there's not many natural touch points uh, for guys to go in and see a GP. So they don't necessarily reflect much on their health mm. particularly and until something really goes wrong yeah no i think you're absolutely right i'm i'm, I'm the same like you say I, i've yeah, barely been to the doctor about anything and even when i am sick you've got a drag me there kicking and screaming pretty yeah, much exactly so, that. Uh, so yeah i really don't go very often i think most guys are the same and it's something that will who's the, the first gp that we saw on episode one talked a lot about was that that yeah the reaching out for help just guys don't do it yeah um and i guess with you know thinking about sort of low mood and depression um you know, with that sort of thing, and I don't know if you're the same, but I think a lot of guys are, where if I'm in the, down in the dumps and I've got a soul cotton, like, don't talk to me. Yes. I don't want to talk to anybody about it. A bit like I have to do. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and I think that's that's going to exacerbate the problem, isn't it? If someone's suffering from low mood, yep. they're going to be even less likely to go and speak to a doctor. Absolutely. And this is one of the most important things I think about testosterone deficiency in that actually it prompts social withdrawal. So... If you're already no, not really used to going to the doctor or you say, you say you do manage to get yourself to go to the doctor and you get to the doctor and you say, I'm feeling low and depressed and they hand you an antidepressant or maybe they don't even do anything because it's the first time you've been there and they think it might be something reactive. So you've just had like a set of life circumstances that have been challenging and you need some time to manage them. And then you don't go back because you don't think you're going to get any help with that. And, and that in itself is an issue. But we know that testosterone deficiency will create social withdrawal, which will mean that you're less likely to reach out to your friends, never mind a doctor. Mm. Um, and if you don't know about the possibility of it being testosterone deficiency, you're not even going to be sitting there on your Reddit forums or, you know, on yeah. YouTube yeah. or whatever other forums it is that you're reaching out to to find out what on earth it is that's going on. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's another real big area where we can start putting information out to say you know it, this could be part of your part of your issue and something to sort of have a look into yeah. Yeah. what what age does do people start declining up so we know that well we know that um sort of between one and two percent a year from the age of 30 um essentially now some people become uh symptomatic with that um and when we say symptomatic that could be um lethargy uh low mood anxiety could be night sweats are these sounding familiar <laughs> um <laughs> it could be that your concentration's bad it could be that you're getting evolving brain fog or you're getting poor memory um and when i say are these sounding familiar it's because they're all very familiar with anybody who's been listening out to the hrt media stuff um for women so i think they tend to evolve over because it's a very gradual period whereas a woman's um uh menopause tends to happen not always but tends to happen a little bit faster so there's you can sort of compare it back to a year ago but actually some of the guys that i see that have got significant testosterone deficiency will actually when i ask them say when did you last feel normal for you and sometimes you, they get this glassy stare and they'll look into the middle distance and be like I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And it's because it's been such an insidious mission creep that actually it's taken a really long time for them to really hit a wall and think, I'm stuck now. Yeah. Help. Yeah, okay. Mad. So yeah, quite important hormone then. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Cool. That's um we'll, we'll go we want to cover this in, in so much detail. Yeah. Um and um, it'd be good to start with some statistics in a second as well. And before we do, though, we, we should probably add and congratulate you because you're actually the first female on our podcast. Well ah, <laughs> I feel honoured to be here. <laughs> yeah. And there's probably a few guys going, what's what, what, so this about? <laughs> yeah. What was a lad's podcast? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess they'll be asking the obvious question as well. How does, uh, I guess, a female doctor, I guess, develop a specialist interest in men's health and testosterone? Yeah. 
let that happen. So I guess, I mean, being a doctor in the army uh, for 17 years, uh, saw a lot of male patients, um, particularly in the regiments that I ended up uh, just happened to serve with. A lot of them were teeth arm units. Um, and there was there was my key patient who, bless him, I've asked him whether or not I've been able to discuss on various uh, platforms and, and he's always been very comfortable with it. But essentially, first time I meet him, uh, incredibly gregarious, sort of alpha male, had a beautiful family, was a uh, big rugby player. He walked into a room and you noticed it and he was um, always getting in trouble but talking his way out of it and just, you know, <laughs> a bit of a wide boy um, and just really enjoyed life. And yeah, he was very excitable and had loads of energy. Uh, fast forward just over 10 years and he I saw him on my clinic list and I was like oh this is gonna be amazing and I didn't even look at his notes before he came into the room and uh was expecting him to sort of bounce in the way he always did and thought he'd done sort of silly injury somewhere doing something ridiculous usually under the influence of alcohol or something and he sort of I don't know, he just looked really miserable. He grey clouded into my office and plonked himself down on a chair, barely looked up to sort of say hi. And I was like, you all right, how's it going? And I took a quick glance at his notes thinking, is this the same guy? Uh, he'd gained weight. He had real sort of central um, obesity. Uh, shoulders were just folded forward. I looked back through his notes and did a quick skim back through and there were three or four pages worth of different antidepressants, some lots of failed, like failure to attend appointments. Um, the mental health department had discharged him because he hadn't bothered going. Um and he just looked utterly miserable. I looked back through his bloods and, you know, he'd had a thyroid checked. He was pre-diabetic at this point. Um, didn't look like he'd seen the inside of a gym for a long time, which was very surprising because he was always really keen in his fizz. Um, and I could barely get eye contact with him. And it was heartbreaking. It was just really sad. And I sort of asked him about how his wife was and how his kids were. And he, was, he always got this like real sparkle in his eye when he spoke about his family. And he just said things weren't very going very well at home. And again, this was really surprising. And I was like, well, you know, he was in he wasn't even in uniform, which again was odd. Um, and I noticed his rank and he didn't look like he's a progressed as far as I was expecting him to. And I didn't really know what to do with him. Yeah. <laughs> I was a bit stuck. And I did what all good GPs do, which was uh, buy myself a little bit of time by saying, should we do some more bloods? And on a complete whim, I tagged on a testosterone onto the end of it. I didn't do anything else. I just did a total testosterone. Didn't even really know much about free testosterone at that point. And um, I booked him in for a half hour review the next time I saw him and luckily checked the testosterone levels before yeah. he came back in and I saw that it was well it wasn't low by the values that I saw but it was low um and did a bit of googling and realized I still didn't know very much spoke to a, uh, another doctor who was an endocrinologist and he said no, no that's fine and I kind of it just didn't quite feel right so Lots more research later, I realised that it was low and um, we tried them on some gels actually and that partially improved things. And then I started getting in contact with the British Society for Sexual Medicine and seeing what their guidelines were and realised actually we were low. We just weren't low according to those local, local guidelines. Um, and fast forward on, he ended up receiving more treatment than that and uh, ended up leaving the military and became got treated by a civilian uh, men's health clinic after that and did significantly better um, and that was my first thought of oh god how many other people have mm. I failed to treat by not knowing yeah. and that kind of led to my interest and yeah yeah okay um, yeah some mad story isn't it and there's probably a lot of people that will resonate with that, I think. Certainly mm. a lot of guys, 100%. Mm. I wanted to ask, because you, you're obviously a, a, a doctor, you've been to med school, and of course the assumption for most people is that med school you know, covers everything. Um, and <laughs> yeah. GPs, general practitioners will have, you know, general That's what we think when we come out as well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate, you know, science moves on as does medicine. Mm -hmm. um, but 
do, you know, is, is there any training around male hormones and testosterone in med school from your recollection? So from my recollection, I believe we touched on testosterone abuse. <laughs> OK. Um, but I don't, we didn't. Yeah. 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 Um, but we didn't. I have no recollection whatsoever of doing anything to do with the, the natural decrease or what we're seeing more, the accelerated decrease in uh, testosterone and just in testosterone deficiency in men. No. Yeah. Um, and, and that said, the same was in G, even later on in my training in GP uh, training as well. Um, and so I... <laughs> As, as much as I come across and a lot of the patients that do end up coming to see me in my men's health clinic, I, I kind of want to bring it back to actually the majority of doctors, although we're not supposed to put it down on our UCAS forms, do join medicine because they want to be helpful and they do have a sort of a, a desire to help their patients. But if they're not given that information, that education at any stage in their in their training it's really hard for them to do so um and a lot of doctors won't necessarily have that that index patient who sort of leads them down that path of why do you think <laughs> hormones are so overlooked though not just for, for testosterone for for women with the menopause all the different types of things it's such an important thing in how people feel and in their day-to-day -day lives mm. and it impacts so many people in so yeah. many different ways so i just don't understand how it's so overlooked yeah, I, th I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think that there have been some dubious trials uh, with that have been reasonably flawed in their study design and in their analysis of results that have led us down a garden path with both women's HRT and with testosterone oh, deficiency. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think certainly uh, we took a real back step with regards to some perceived risks with women's HRT and malignancies, breast and ovarian malignancies. And I think similarly, there have been other findings with um, men's testosterone replacement therapy. Um, and even, I mean, uh, uh, the Americans have had black box warnings put on testosterone containing treatments really? uh, with regards to yeah with regards to um, cardiovascular complications and prostate cancer uh, as well and I think I think historically I think it was maybe the 1930s that we were looking at having exogenous testosterone available for patients and that people actually saw that it was very good for uh, men with low mood, particularly. That was one of the earlier uh, earlier findings. Um, and there were various sort of progressions and then regressions in uh, its uh, introduction into mainstream medicine. Um, and medicine moves pretty slowly when it comes to um, progression in some forms. Um, is it because they got to be careful? Uh, like even more so now, which is good and useful for everybody involved but there's a lot of red tape in bringing out and developing new drugs uh, and also in getting drugs approved by big organizations uh, like NICE and there's the phenomenal eye-watering amount of funding that's required to get uh, medications and drugs approved uh, to get put onto guidelines and formularies um, even basic drugs that we know we know are safe if they're not approved by formularies then GPs aren't at liberty to prescribe them uh, in ways that might be optimal yeah that's what Ed was talking about wasn't it with the trials that's what I say yeah, yeah we had that on another one yeah that's what yeah. I said yeah, yeah. So it was quite like times it costs so much that they, they feel like it's never going to get done yeah, yeah. and it, you know? it makes me think of um i saw uh, a scene while hot was on joe rogan's podcast recently mm. talking about sort of cardiac disease and the vaccine which we won't get into because yeah. it's uh, <laughs> a bit oh, dicey God. but yeah. but you know i think he he basically made the point around you know when you are working in medicine you know there, there is definitely definitely a reputational risk of going a bit too bold with your uh your thoughts on stuff as well so i guess there's that yeah. to consider as well isn't there yeah yeah okay um so statistic wise then so i'd be interested to hear a little bit about i guess some of the numbers if if you happen to know them um so i guess first of all you mentioned a second ago around sort of um i forget exactly what you said i've got halfway to, to write it down it was <laughs> it was i think the ranges from the sexual 
um, uh, what did you who did you say you approached with the uh, the gentleman that you were treating? Oh, so yeah, so the British Society for Sexual Medicine. Yeah, so you said yeah. that their numbers versus local numbers were a little bit different. I think you mentioned. Yeah. So, so what what's normal? And I guess who do we you know who do we listen to? Yeah. So um, it depends. So lab laboratory ranges across the country um, are different, and the reason being that they. Uh, will take the whole population of people that they're testing. Um, so the adult male population from 18 to however old. Um, and they will look at testosterone levels that are checked and they'll get rid of the bottom 5% as abnormal and get rid of the top 5% and then whatever is in the middle. Um, now, the difficulty with that is that 88-year-old um, Bob, who's just finished a course of chemo, um, will be in the same bag as 18-year-old James who has not and is feeling fine and, you know, and they'll get sort of lumped into the same. So the it, it doesn't really give a very specific um, population size really to be comparing um, and it doesn't really take into account whether or not someone's just been really ill or whether or not they're fitting well or what their age is. And clearly, um, you don't really want to be lumped in if you're 18 year old James and you don't really want to be in the same category as Bob, mm. um, <laughs> which is kind of, yeah, is really key. Um, but equally, we don't really know how different things should look from person to person and we don't really have very good stats on that yeah. or facts and figures um, and I think we're a long way off that I'm guessing different people can have different ranges that are natural to them Yeah. yeah so some people might function better at 20 yeah. and then other people might function fine mm. at 10 yeah. yeah is that a thing yeah. yeah and then they just change from that so the notice might be that they go from 20 to 12 and then in that time they feel like crap when they're at 12 but then they'll go to the doctor and they'll be within range. Is yeah. That, is that something that happens? And I think the other thing to remember is that the time of the day, like you you might fluctuate massively. So people talk about taking their, um, taking testosterone between 7 and 11 in the morning because it's going to be higher during those times. Whereas actually you could take uh, testosterone three times, level three times during the day and it look completely different. Oh, really? Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, and that's the other thing that's really important to uh, remember to check when somebody's had a testosterone level done. Actually, it, it's dependent on what time of the day that level's been done. Does anyway. that change through like acti activity or how you're feeling or yeah. what you're eating or yeah. hydration? I don't know. What yeah, you're... so um, if you have, so for example, if you've done, if you've recently had a cold or whatever or a chest infection or been unwell, then your testosterone level might drop down for a little bit afterwards. Um, if you do take a testosterone level and this will vary person to person if you take a testosterone level directly after exercise depending on the type of exercise it might increase or it might decrease if you've done some sort of endurancy and, and, and it depends on that window but there are fluctuations in that so there, there's lots of different things that it's dependent on um and you know that's it just adds another variable to make it really not that straightforward for a gp to be managing it in primary care partly because actually they then need to be you know committing to time frames and everything to be taking those um those levels in as well mm -hmm. and if someone's coming in already saying that they feel unwell and generally ropey and run down um and then you're adding in a, a specific time frame to be taking that testosterone level it's it's you know it's it's an extra barrier mm. yeah definitely so so what officially what is the range in the uk so the british society for sexual medicine um and these guidelines were were brought about by an international consensus of experts and they were andrologists, urologists, endocrinologists, GPs um, and they got lots of doctors to sit down in a room and agree about something which doesn't often happen but they did this um, and the guidelines that uh, the, the British Society for Sexual Medicine came back with um, were basically saying that anybody with a total testosterone below 12 and symptoms and the symptoms were um low libido erectile dysfunction um and they wouldn't need to have all of them but low you know from the list of low libido erectile dysfunction brain fog poor memory um speaking of which um uh yeah poor memory um, and it could be a selection of any one of those um, 
and they could be considered for a trial of treatment, essentially, or free testosterone uh, below 0.22. So I think the um, important thing in remembering that is making sure that the blood test is taken at the appropriate time of day, not taken after a night shift as well, um, which which can change things as well, sort of extreme fatigue, um, uh, and sort of making sure that it's taken in a in you know when there haven't been other reasons for them to have a low testosterone levels and that might be sort of high alcohol intake um or particular drugs uh, including things like opiates and things like that so chronic pain patients can sometimes have a different slightly different picture as well yeah okay so, yeah. there's i know you mentioned that there was a, an international consensus that came up mm. with that range is it different in the states because and again i'm no expert but just looking around this loosely it, it looks like they're a little bit more forward thinking and and seem to the treatment is a lot easier there i don't know if it's because it's primarily private health that's care. literally what i was about to say pri- private yeah. Healthcare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but is, is the range different or is it the same in the u.s as well um i don't know so i think from practitioner to practitioner mm. from from my understanding and um no doubt the guys are going to be sort of uh <laughs> concerned about this but from practitioner to practitioner there does seem to be a little bit there does seem to be more variation i think that the healthcare model in the states is different in that um it's private so it's patient driven um more than anything else you know then then less having to be cautious of their budget however that being patient driven does however mean that they also need to be able to decide whether or not how much of this is being set by the insurance companies because some insurance companies won't cover um for testosterone replacement therapy and that means that it's then being that makes it super expensive for the patient um and sometimes um not really achievable to that large group of people but i know that it does change from state to state and i don't know i wouldn't be able to uh, reel off what their treatment levels were but i it, it feels from um, my brief time in the States, and I went to a um, conference over there last year at the International uh, uh, Society for Sexual Medicine over in Miami, um, just after going to another um, teach from some of the uh, other andrologists and Ali Gilbert. Um, it does feel a lot more socially acceptable over there and better known about. Um yeah, and there's, they're, they're much more comfortable with the term of testosterone optimization versus testosterone replacement and treating a deficiency. Um, and they're a lot more comfortable with discussing anti aging medication um, rather than just treating deficiency, which is very much the zone that we're in in the UK. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, and sorry, just to clarify, you, you, you mentioned we mentioned the range a second ago. So mm. you said it was under 12 with symptoms. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the range, the, the full range, is it, I think it's 8 to 30, somewhere around there, is that right? Um, the range, what, as in where to keep them within? The, the, where to yeah, keep them within? Like the NHS. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think... I've seen cutoffs at 25 yeah. for normal, so yeah. 8 to 25. Um, I think some of the men's health clinics will treat to 40, 45. Okay. Um, Not high. Yeah, some. <laughs> <laughs> this is half the problem, right, isn't it? It's just yeah. what you say. But, yeah, but, and yeah, this is, crazy. yeah, but again, I think in the States, they would probably treat around that level, maybe higher. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's quite, quite a broad range then, and... I just say a little bit of variability which yeah and I think this is where we need to be careful and this is again it's just one of those like yawn responses of more research required mm-hmm. um, because actually where you start drifting into supra physiological as in higher than as normal physiological uh, would normally f- uh, exist in normal physiology um, that's where potentially that you can have complications and I think that's you know, maintaining safety while while um, looking after someone's symptoms and making sure that you're you're making them you're getting those symptoms controlled and you're restoring them uh, to where they should be mm-hmm. is what's really important. Uh, I think a lot of the complications that some doctors will have seen 
uh, previously might have been actually they're sort of superimposing what they've seen with people who've been using anabolic steroids and stacking or cycling and doing crazy high doses, which is really different to what you'd be looking at with regards to testosterone replacement therapy, which is really where you're taking a guy who's got erectile dysfunction, low libido, poor memory, and is just feeling horrible, low mood. Mm -hmm. um, and you're essentially just giving him a hormone that's going to help him feel normal again and yeah. that's going to help him get his marriage back on track and mm -hmm. help him be able to perform at work or get a job again yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know definitely. just some just some basics yeah, okay. yeah. Um, um all right wicked thank you um and i i, I feel like you, you i think you're probably going to say you're not sure on this because i think you've kind of already covered it but mm. do we know how many men like are, are estimated to be deficient not sure next yeah. no okay. no <laughs> no so i think i think it's difficult i think um as discussed with regards to the range i think it's going to be really hard to um you know come back at that with an answer but i also think that we don't we still don't know what is normal for everybody yeah. and we do know that the average testosterone levels in men is dropping everybody's read the forbes well a lot of guys that are watching this and have had an interest in this are going to have read the forbes mm. forbes article written a few years back which sort of points out um it takes out a load of data from the aging male study which showed very clearly that we know that testosterone levels are dropping. We don't really know why. There's a whole bunch of theories that, you know, there's um, social impacts and social elements of it, uh, that there are endocrine dis disrupting chemicals or EDCs kicking around and like BPA and things in our food chain, hormones getting into our food chain. Um, and um, potentially even more sedentary lifestyles, you know obesity being a thing there's a lot of things going on lots of connection um and there i think a combination of all of the above plus a few extras we haven't thought about yet yeah sitting on the fence <laughs> yeah yeah it's probably but, the, yeah. the signals from the iphones all sorts going well, on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, i think i 5g think, yeah, 5G, yeah. yeah. <laughs> microwaves yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I think, uh, yeah, I think inactivity, that's the lifestyle. I think that's got to have a, a huge impact, doesn't it, I think? Yeah. Um, 100%. And um, you kind of mentioned, and we'll, we'll probably touch on it a little bit more a bit later, but you talked about sort of optimization versus replacement. Mm -hmm. I guess optimization, I feel like that would be the things that you can kind of do yourself, like losing a bit of weight, going to the gym, moving more, yeah, quitting alcohol, reducing alcohol, that type of thing, right? Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think one of the things that, is really important to do is try and attempt the lifestyle things before you start TRT. And that sounds like a really, really good thing to do. But when you feel like crap, you don't have the motivation to get off the couch. Like, I mean, I have some guys who have had their blood test bought for them by a mate. They essentially get like wheeled into my room <laughs> and then they get dragged back in to have the results given to them because they are just, they're just, Apathy is one of the things I'm mm. like flat, just meh. I see it with some of my clients all the time. I see to I see I see to some of them like, have you got your blood test done yet? Oh, yeah. Not yet. And I'm like, I haven't got done. around to it. Get yeah. it done in six months now, and you still not got it done. You're still saying that you're tired all the time, you know? Yeah. Mm. And um, they just think it's maybe because they're doing too much or too this, but then when they're 45 to 50, yeah, it's probably the main cause of it is that their test has gone wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, you, you meant you touched on a second ago around, um, I guess. The, the different types or, or the different reasons that people might drop can we just get into that a little bit more because I think a lot of people again are, are un, it's all uninformed about this topic will maybe assume that low testosterone is as a result of people taking loads of steroids mm -hmm. shutting down natural production and that's why they've got low testosterone and mm -hmm. that's I guess the case for some people mm -hmm. um, but then you do have you know the other population which we kind of touched on a little bit already which are just maybe sort of males that are aging yeah um and just seeing a natural decline yeah and that may sort of get to a point where it's deficient so is that primarily the two examples of of why it happens well i think i think we're like to touch on the first group yeah i think that's really important so this first group of guys that we all look at um, so people who've used steroids 
I think one of the things that we need to look at is why have they used steroids? Mm. And that's this is going to sound really like GP and a little bit fluffy. But actually, for some guys, one of the things that we talk about loads when you talk about um, females and social media exposure and, you know, filters and isn't it really tough for them having, you know, these unrealistic expectations and unrealistic goals, um, physical goals and everything to to sort of go up against but we don't do that for our guys and actually like our era we're growing up on like terminator <laughs> and all the cool arnie movies um and you know there's there's a little bit of that so i think it's an interesting topic to bring out and steroids because of the internet are becoming more and more available they are everywhere they are so normal in gyms um the information on what potentially the long-term side effects are isn't really out there. Um, And I think a lot of guys just see the cool results that some people get um, and some people get away with it. And other people will have done one cycle and then their life just went crash after that. They didn't necessarily associate it with the cycle, um, but they then sort of became a bit of an introvert. They went from being quite, you know, getting along quite well and having quite a good social group to becoming more and more introverted and socially disconnected. And then life changed for them. Their career progression changed, their relationships changed, their intimate relationships changed, family relationships. And it all just kind of went off pop. And sometimes they don't even, they'll come to me 10 years after that event and they won't even associate that change with them with that with that life event mm. um and sometimes they'll have been sort of nudged to go and have a look and then when i ask them about steroid use they'll say you know oh yeah but i didn't i don't think it was that much of a problem it was only really brief use and it's like well when did your symptoms start oh, about six months after i stopped that <laughs> okay <laughs> um but i i think I mean, I don't know, certainly as a parent, that would be one of the things that, from a protective point of view, it's a conversation that you can have early. Um, And the visual benefits of taking steroids for young guys can be seen really obviously, but the dangers of them, like, I mean, it's like any time you're taking drugs, um, the dangers don't seem so apparent right there and then, but it looks really cool being that trapped in a gym and being able to lift it all up. (laughs) Just a test... That mm-hmm. even if they are, say they're like 25, been training for five years, uh-huh. wanting to take steroids, would mm-hmm. just taking a bit of extra testosterone be the safest form of uh, uh, You don't steroid? really know what you're taking. There is a really good, I'm not going to be able to tell you what it is, uh, study that had, it was like, uh, meta-analysis where they took five and a half thousand steroid samples from gyms and um, the stuff they found in there wasn't really what it was. I was about to say, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was all sorts in there, wasn't it? Yeah, all sorts of chaos, but not what you were expecting. And I think, I think that's one thing that I would say with that. But the other thing is that what the guy in the gym is going to tell you that is a little bit of testosterone yeah. often isn't a little bit of testosterone. Yeah. But the other thing is that we don't, and there obviously haven't been many controlled studies trying to figure out um, what a little bit of test looks like in the gym. But also there seem to be some people that will do or say that they've done a cycle uh, and then come never really come back from it. And we don't we don't know why there is that some people just can do it for 10, 15 years, come off it and then drift back up to their normal 22, 25, whatever. Yeah. Um, I was having this discussion recently with someone, they were saying that you can do tests for a little bit and then you, your, your, your system will definitely come back. And I was saying, no, it doesn't. And they were like, well, I was told it does. And I'm like, <laughs> like yeah. are you being told by because they're a fucking idiot? Like, well, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, 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 and for some people, it, it might. can shut down. Yeah, yeah it that's can. All I, that's absolutely. what I was trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can, it shut, can down. shut down. Even if you've done it for 12 weeks, small dose, yeah. whatever, you can be the unlucky one yeah. and it shuts down. And it doesn't you know? come back. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's definitely a misconception because I think as you, as you talk now, you know, I'm, I'm fairly informed compared mm-hmm. to your average show perhaps, but... Yeah, I hadn't really thought about the fact that you could do one cycle and just wreck yourself permanently. Well, it's just, you don't really know whatever yeah. is in that one cycle. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's one of the, you know, and, it's, and people talk about doing, oh, 
I, I don't think I've ever taken to some, talked to somebody who's taken steroids who hasn't taken pharmaceutical grade steroids because uh, you know they've all got such pretty packaging these days around me. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think it's it's just knowing and understanding the risks. Um, but actually, often if they're if they're truly about it for training gains and things like that, if you ask them whether or not they cleaned up their lifestyle and done all the other things that they can do to optimize training like the boring stuff like the sleep hygiene stuff that takes and time. the dietary Absolutely stuff not. and uh, <laughs> what do you mean cut out yeah drink <laughs> the water <laughs> cut out alcohol <laughs> yeah you're gonna kick me out in a second aren't you <laughs> um but yeah so i think those i think those things are they're just less sexy to talk about and it's yeah. you know i call it the fundamentals just yeah fundamentals the, yeah the things that all you do them, and yeah. that's that's a good base. Yeah. yeah, but it's like we've talked about loads, and everyone's looking for a fucking shortcut these days, and yeah. they don't want to put the put the long long yards in first before trying these things. But yeah, it's it's a yeah it's a, it's a really no, notable point I think about just you don't don't know what you're getting, mm. and I think a lot of people will assume they can do it like a, a PCT or a post course therapy mm. treatment, um, and you know what is it Clomid? Is that what they take? Yeah, yeah bang that in and pop your uncle they're sorted but mm. could be anything right as you say yeah yeah okay yeah, absolutely. yeah so then we've got the other the other half then the unlucky ones who maybe haven't had uh you know made these choices in their life but just naturally start seeing yeah. decline so talk to me about those guys yeah. yeah so sometimes it can be these can be the guys with the mission creep testosterone levels that are just drifting off down um they tend to be the ones who've uh, sort of thought about it, thought about it, thought about it, and um, all of a sudden, 10 years has gone by, and you know, it, there'll be usually some catalyst into action. It might be um, n being unable to work or breakdown of the family home. Um, that one's always really heartbreaking because often, you know, sometimes by the time they get to me, that's kind of irretrievable. Um, and they can have really, really positive. I mean, both camp, both camps can, but they can have really positive um, effects from taking testosterone with therapy placement. Uh, the time frames for it improving uh, can vary, mm. and you get sort of some people who a week later are going. I can feel it working. This is brilliant. It's fantastic. And then other guys that are like sat at three months going, Doc, are you, are you serious? <laughs> like, what the fuck? I still haven't got a six pack or, you know, I'm still feeling yeah. really low or um, really low mood. Or sometimes people get a bit anxious first up um, for the first few weeks. Um, and that can kick around for a bit. And that can be a bit of a kick in the nuts when you've been feeling really low and you kind of Pardon think you found, yeah, literally. <laughs> and you kind of think you found like the ultimate solution and you want this all to because you've worked so hard and you've finally got there and you've finally got someone who's prepared to prescribe you testosterone and there you are anxious and more emotional and you know and I, I think sometimes this sort of emotional journey getting onto TRT can mean that you kind of want it to happen overnight and it, it doesn't always sometimes it does but also there's the other bit in that like TRT is just like me handing you a toolkit and you like if you leave it in the box on the corner and the, it's not going to do it for you that again it comes back to the boring stuff of sleep hygiene it, you need to do like look reflect in a little bit because you're being given the mental clarity to be able to do that mm. and start thinking about you know what are your goals where are you aiming for um what do you want to happen where are you are you managing to do any meditation and um you know for some people that could be breath work for, you know and starting slow some people just crack out the david goggins and try and get back to training <laughs> and start you know that's how they motivate themselves mm -hmm. but it can do so much but it will do so much more if you get decent uh you know fitness advice or decent nutrition advice and then carry it out <laughs> and then yeah and that's where i think for me um sort of the implement implementation of real holistic care so rather than me sitting here going right okay here's your testosterone off you pop and see you in three months time uh we'll check your bloods again and i'll let you know whether or not you win another prescription you know actually for me the important bit is saying okay cool so this is what your body composition is now this is where we we need to really to get to because your body fat is putting you at risk of type 2 diabetes um 
And actually, if we sort that out, the testosterone will be able to help you a bit with that, but you need to stop eating like that and start exercising like this. Um, and I think that's something, again, in the NHS, we don't, we just don't have, and it's, you know, God save our NHS, but we just don't have the resources a lot of the time to do that. And you'll know that in your line of work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being able to sort of give people hopefully a bit of motivation to be able to sort of look into that side of things as well. Yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's a good point, I think, isn't it? Because we, you know, we've, we've said it's treating deficiency. So, you know, we're correct that deficiency was, was just ultimately bringing somebody back to a normal level. Mm. And then people with a normal level will still need to then put the work in yeah. to, to improve other aspects of their health mm. as well. Um, and does, does this happen to everybody? I think we already mentioned that, you know, from a certain age, it declines on average a certain percentage. Mm. Um, did we say from 30, like, is it 1%? Is that, did I make that up or is, yeah, is yeah. that fairly accurate? Yeah, between 1% and 2%, yeah. 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 So does that mean that everybody, um, everyone, well, not everybody, every every guy will eventually see these symptoms creeping in? Um, not necessarily. And I think it's dangerous to say that you need to normalise the acceptance of those symptoms. Um, I think another study, or well, there have been a few studies that have shown that actually having... Um, even if you feel symptom free and your testosterone levels are low, then actually there it does reduce cardiovascular risk factor by putting it into the not back into the normal range. And I think that's a really interesting concept that will make a lot of doctors nervous as well. Because actually, if you're saying, "Well, hang on a sec, we're now treating these guys that are feeling fine," but if we're reducing bone mineral density and we are increasing cardiovascular risk by having low testosterone and we're increasing the likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes by treating with testosterone we are reducing so many different types mm. so many different causes of mortality um, and that's not to say that we all need to live forever but actually the you know the hip fractures we're saving the um, cardiac events that we're preventing the you know the complications from anemia for example you know there's a lot there's a lot to it. Haven't you got to be careful with your blood pressure and stuff like yeah. that with, with testosterone? Yeah, so the blood good. pressure is one of the things that we do uh, recommend that you monitor uh, when you're on TRT um, because it's a good marker of endothelial uh, uh, dysfunction as well. Um, and we do monitor cholesterol levels as well mm -hmm. uh, when you're on TRT. Um, and I think sort of, but like I said, going back to that point, normalising um, testosterone levels is protective in both those spheres anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we look at, and that one of the things that I'm cautious about sort of normalising progression of those symptoms, particularly with things like erectile dysfunction, yeah. um, actually erectile dysfunction as a GP is a really good opportunistic moment because it is one of the few things that guys will go to the doctor about if something goes <laughs> wrong there <laughs> that, that that might bring them in yeah. although now what i'm really concerned about is things like viagra and cialis or sildenafil mm. they're so available online yeah, so actually the know. one opportunity that a gp has to reach out and go hang on a second there might be an issue here is when a guy comes in and says i'm having a re having issues with erectile dysfunction and that is, you know, is termed as a canary in the mine um, with regards to some uh, really potential early marker for um, vascular dysfunction. Um, and that could, you know, that could go on and often does go on to lead to um, MI or heart attacks. Um, and it's essentially, that's one of the most important things, opportunities that we get to reach out and do other t uh, tests to check for, you know, are they pre-diabetic? Are they having other vascular endothelial dysfunction elsewhere? Are they having blood pressure issues um, and things like that? And that, that we, we lose that a lot now because the majority of the times if the guy hasn't been to see a GP for 10, 15 years or whatever, actually, if he can get it online, he probably thinks it's going to be easier than getting in to see the GP going online anyway. Well, Maybe. If you, if you can get to see a GP these days. Yeah, it's challenging. <laughs> it's, uh, it's don't, challenging. Don't start you. Don't start. <laughs> I know. Oh, no, no. It's like every Set time. Up. <laughs> Big up to all um, my yeah. GP friends, though. <laughs> it's tough yeah. out there. <laughs> the other thing I was going to ask is, um, see, online you see a lot of these marketing mm -hmm. 
um, things for your blood pressure mm -hmm. in the bodybuilding like industry. Just you have stuff like Systol Max in uh, mm -hmm. like heart health stuff and all that sort of stuff. Is mm. is that worth getting to keep your blood pressure in check, or is would you need pharmaceutical stuff if that makes sense? Like, yeah, to keep your, I think you. You see it everywhere, don't you? Like, yeah. I don't know what I do anyway. That in the bodybuilding in the mm. steroid community, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, oh look after your heart, make sure your blood pressure's not high, take this. And I'm, I'm like reading it like really what could be in there. I think, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's what's in there. It's, you need to be thinking about the other reasons that your blood pressure is high. Mm -hmm. You need to be looking at things like your yeah, hematocrit and knowing what's going on with that. You need to be looking at are there other, um, is there other vascular dysfunction going on as well? Yeah. Um, and actually, if there is other vascular dysfunction, then you just need to know there is what the other causes are um, and whether or not you've got other risk factors um, uh, and it's not something that can necessarily those risks aren't necessarily things that can be managed by a tablet that may or may not be what it says it is yeah that's what, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's what I was asking yeah, yeah. you hear it a lot of the time as soon as like someone will be spouting off about TRT or mm. this and that make sure you get your, uh, yeah. your heart health stuff and this yeah. and that and I'm like really if it's not there's just so many uncontrolled thing. variables there and yeah. i think sort of the sort of making safe of that it's just hard to know where to start and i think that partly comes from the polypharmacy or poly i don't even want to call it pharmacy but <laughs> probably not sure what you're taking <laughs> a c is that yeah. a, new, a new phrase <laughs> just coined tonight <laughs> Yeah, there we go. We've trademarked it now. Yeah, done. <laughs> yeah. Um, just another little thing about that. What about these um, online coaches and stuff that are prescribing steroids to people? Or not prescribing, like giving advice about different steroids they're taking, mm. you know, get them from Joe Blogs on WhatsApp, all this type of stuff. Mm. Is there any regulations on any comebacks for them? <laughs> No, of course not. <laughs> no, <laughs> not unless they're actually qualified. No, that's what, no, other than being so arrested. Say, so, yeah, that's right. <laughs> what you the mean? police. The, the police might be a comeback if they end up. No, that's what I'm saying. So, is there any comebacks to that? Because you see all these coaches online, well, if, if you bodybuilding, if you and they're they're telling people if you prescribe somebody anything and you're not qualified to do we're not it, not prescribing them, dead. telling them to do it. You're gonna you, you're gonna end up. Do you think? That, do you think that? So, so it's fact. You will, of course, you will. Do you think? So we honestly don't. I'm gonna leave this to you guys here. Like, <laughs> you guys are having fun here. No, being serious. Like, you know, you got like your online coach who's maybe like a PT, and he's say, saying to people, oh, "I take if, this if, much test." If, this if, much if your missus got an online coach, yeah, and he he told her that she needs to get on some gear, yeah, and then she dropped dead, right? You'd fucking sue him, wouldn't you? You. I, I, the, what I'm asking is, could you? I don't know. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. that was my really grown up answer. No, I, see, <laughs> I mean, I, I know, it wouldn't I've be seen, advisable. I've seen all these cunts everywhere, and that's what I'll we'll call them <laughs> saying, take this, do that, blah, 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 take, you know, this yeah. shit, that shit, whatever. Maybe. And I'm thinking, how the fuck are they getting away with it? But there's no account, I don't know if there's, there's any accountability if you don't have a governing body. That's what I'm I mean, saying. it's like, not a good there, plan, any, like, just not a good plan. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah I mean, for, yeah, for anybody listening. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're sat here with a, a sort of, a, you know, a <laughs> educated, qualified, insured you know general yeah, practitioner gp do, doing doing this and yeah anybody that's well anything not, less yeah, than that yeah. should not be prescribing fucking steroids yeah, 100%, yeah. but you know most stories are illegal full stop anyway mate but um but yeah i mean there's a reason pts have insurance it's liability yeah. um and you can get insurance to prescribe steroids to people so i, I think prescribe but, was the wrong way what i'm saying <laughs> was it's like you know you know they are they are giving out this fucking advice all if, the time if they? i was I, you i'd take steroids yeah. yeah but i think i think though one i think one of the interesting points from this though is that there is a hell of a lot of advice at forums and things like that kicking out a lot more accessible information than you might be getting from clinicians because it is more available to you in your room when you're reading about this stuff at night and actually there isn't very much information being put out from the medical sphere about what is and isn't safe and actually sometimes when people go in uh, and I've I felt reasonably undereducated in the past when someone's come in and she's given me like the list of things that they'd taken in the past. <laughs> and I go, I'm just gonna give me give me five minutes with Google there. <laughs> and and I'm I'm yeah. often pretty straightforward with patients who have come in and said this is what I've taken. And I said I d haven't heard of a lot of these things. Uh, can you talk me through them? And actually, it, it's interesting 
going off, you know, what they've said. Um, and so many of these things have got multiple different names according to what country that they've come from or, you know. Uh, and I think that the education point on that, um, and again, going back to the fact that people don't know that actually the, the layers of governance that medical clinicians have is really protective for them and they don't necessarily get that and actually the layers of decision making that have had to sort of bulletproof some of the safety standards of drugs and medications it might sound boring and frustrating but you know there there have been quite well thought thought out processes to make sure that they are safe um so I think the accessibility of some of the things and the medications and everything that come about in gyms almost make people think, oh, well, it must be safe because everybody here is doing it. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that we just need to sort of guard against um, and make sure that we're educating our young people to think a bit more critically about making rapid decisions because everybody else is doing it <laughs> mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah but i guess this is where we do need more people like you though isn't it because you're right there isn't enough information out there um so people are naturally going to go online and, and follow the advice of you know these jacked up online coaches yeah, just influencers or who, who talk well and know a few names so yeah right okay let's move on <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? I'm enjoying it, it's fun. Just oh, gonna like leave you guys in 20 it. different directions for rappers, <laughs> honestly. Oh, honestly, I, yeah, I, I must piss him off because he's got like a little thing and I'm like, what about this? <laughs> um, so we were, we were kind of, as, we, as we've been going on, we've been touching on the various sort of symptoms and signs of. Mm -hmm. A low test and I just wanted to kind of box that into to sort of a, a conversation um, because as we've gone there's some obvious ones that I think everyone's kind of aware of yeah. um, there's been a few that you've mentioned actually that I wasn't aware of even being a thing um, so the obvious ones I think you know is probably erectile dysfunction mm -hmm. um, and potentially fertility issues mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably a big one that people are aware of and it was interesting when you said about that's normally a trigger for people to go to a GP because I honestly thought that might have been the opposite that guys wouldn't want to talk about that sort of thing well, um, now, now they've got a get out clause they don't need to yeah, <laughs> connect. yeah exactly <laughs> um, but you made some really interesting points about other health markers that, that could be causing that as well so there's not just there's a number of reasons that somebody should probably go to their GP mm. if they're experiencing erectile dysfunction and not just bypass it Absolutely. with the uh, over the counter stuff now you can get mm. Um, and then there's obviously the low mood, which we kind of touched on at the very start. Yeah. Um, so I think we should spend some more time on that because I know when we spoke previously, it was it was a really interesting point that you made about the way guys behave when they're suffering low mood and depression. Yeah. And we 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 briefly touched on it already because I, I I definitely recognise this behaviour where if I'm you know not in a great spot, I just don't want to talk to people. And I think there's a lot of messaging at the moment around uh, men's mental health about you know talk is good to talk. Yeah. Uh, you know and yeah it is and they should and they can but i think you made an interesting point that typically guys although they can they won't yeah um and that's a big factor so that's let's just talk a little bit more about i guess the link um yeah between the the, the sort of potentially the deficiency in testosterone and the depression but then obviously the men just not doing anything about it mm. like what, what do you typically see apathy yeah can't be asked yeah um, and they get a bit boring. They don't want to go out. They don't want to do stay up drinking. They just kind of get a bit flat and a bit grey man. Um, they might just be turning up as opposed to, you know, relating and conversing and stuff um, and can just get flat. And I had one guy, I remember, bless him, just saying, I don't even want to hang out with me. <laughs> and it was just oh, like, no bless him, it was just like, he didn't really feel like he had much to offer the group. Mm. And that that sort of social withdrawal, I think, it's, it's, it's for some guys, it's not even getting tearful, it's not getting angry, it's just not really caring and just getting really flat. Whereas, you know... Um, and I think sometimes that, that might mean that they wouldn't go, I'm really low. Because actually, if you ask them what they're really low about, they don't really know. Mm. Um, it's, just, it's just a feeling, isn't it? Yeah. It's just a feeling. You just sometimes, I think we all get it anyway, but you, you wake up, you can't be asked to get out of bed. Oh, yeah. But then I think it's recognising that if you if that's happened over weeks, months, mm. even years, like you said, yeah. 
you know, it's probably high probability that yeah. you have got low test. Yeah. Yeah, that the, the apathy thing is is an interesting one because I think I've I've seen it um before written that it's just like the you've just lost a lust for life. Yeah. And I think that's a really good way to kind of think about it. Um yeah. and if have you kind of you kind of mentioned this already, like one, one or two anecdotes, but do, do you see like people that come into your clinic that are, are, are sort of being medicated with antidepressant oh, medication? God, yeah. 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 Do they and, come off of? Yeah. Um, and it, sometimes depending on how long they've been on them for, um, it has to be done slowly. And it's definitely not something I'd recommend people do off their own back. Um, it still needs to be done slowly. And like I said, the support, and the, the mental health work that they have to put in themselves. Because the other thing is that you can then give them testosterone replacement therapy, but if they've been depressed or having low mood for 10 years, even if you give testosterone replacement, they're not necessarily all of a sudden overnight going to go ah, back in. S- mindset, some do, but yeah, exactly. It changes their mindset and that mental plasticity that they get from being positive, outward looking people. They've developed a habit of being a bit Eeyore um, or a bit flat sometimes for some people. Um, and so that's where actually going through the process of, you know, resetting goals for some people. And it might be that they they get to a stage now where they are in a better space to be doing things like CBT, for example, um, or taking a different approach. And that's why the, the whole underpinning thing of actually having some health coaching, um, you know, boosting your hormones as well by doing some decent training and, you know, hitting some goals and, and trying to make yourself accountable and things. And all of those good things are still super important. But it can take a lot of different approaches but I think sometimes where there have been life events that have also been challenging for them that they haven't even been able to they haven't had the energy the inclination or just that meh to be able to hit it um, at that point with TRT can sometimes seem a little bit more manageable um, with with additional support yeah I think that's something that for, for a lot of guys could really consider um, and we'll, we'll come on to some of the treatments and stuff shortly mm. um, so we'll talk a little bit more about I guess what what that kind of looks like in detail um, and then some of the other signs and symptoms so the couple that you mentioned that I, I didn't really think about um, one was the night sweats yep um, so I, I wasn't aware of that being a symptom at all and mm-hmm. the other one was um, sort of like well, I guess osteoporosis um, yep. I don't know if you diagnose it is that but brittle bones yep um, again that was not something I thought about and yep. obviously this is something that certainly with older females you know certainly in our industry people are very aware of is, is, a, is a thing so is is that quite a quite a common symptom or is that more of a Yeah, word? so it's yeah, so it's it's a known side effect of having low testosterone chronically over a long period of time. Um anemia, unexplained anemia is another big one. Um you know, they I think there's a stat out there saying as well that 48 to 50 percent of type 2 diabetics will develop low testosterone Mm -hmm. it's not on the quaff to test for this for men with type 2 diabetes just saying (laughs) anyway um but you know it's it's not something that's routinely checked for and you know um just having a knowledge and an understanding that an unexplained anemia in a man should be you should be having a look at that at low testosterone Mm -hmm. it just should be on a standard yeah. uh, standard set of blood tests and everything because it's one of those things you could pick it up early. Yeah. But it, it could be that you'd uh, get to that stage and go, oh, look, low testosterone, what do I do with that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and be back in my position. But we've got a set of guidelines that we can reach out to mm-hmm. um, yeah. to be able to do that. And then the night sweats. Um, is that like a, is that an acute thing or is that chronic? I mean, I know with the menopause, often that people refer to it, it's going for the, the change, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's that this suggests it's kind of hormonal fluctuations overnight. Yeah. Like, yeah. So is, is how, similar, how's that it's exactly the same process? Yeah. 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 Okay. And sometimes it can be chronic. Sometimes it can be acute. Um, and I, I had one guy who didn't actually mention it, and it was probably my history taking that omitted to, to, to check with it. But I'd seen his testosterone levels and thought, oh, and uh, yeah, and he started on TRT and did really well. We did weight management stuff with him as well, actually, um, and he did really well. And he said, oh, 
it's really weird. My night sweats have stopped <laughs> about three weeks, three months in. So my night sweats have stopped. Is that anything to do with the TRT? I was like, oh, should have spotted that. But yeah, um, but yeah. Uh, so that that does tend to resolve if it's a symptom. But that that said, a lot of guys don't get every symptom in the book. Yeah. Um, and some people just get a handful. The low libido and erectile dysfunction does tend to be, they, they do tend to be uh, uh, sort of existent to a degree. Um, uh, and they are, but sometimes, like I said, people have come in, if they've got erectile dysfunction, but libido is preserved, often they'll treat the erectile dysfunction with Tadalafil or whatever, Viagra, whatever they get over the internet. Um and it's not until the testosterone continues to drop and they no longer, they, when they drop their libido as well, mm. then they start getting into the space where they can't be asked with the erectile dysfunction medications because the libido has gone. So what's the point anyway? Um, and that tends to be, that's like stage two, but you could be years down the line after you've been using um erectile dysfunction medications for a bit as well yeah okay and yeah i'd never even thought about those two things being separate actually mm. oh yeah absolutely that. yeah so that's um one of the interesting things that you like when guys come in with low uh and it took me a little while to work it out but when guys were coming in with low libido and erectile dysfunction i'd be like oh well we can give you some tadalafil daily tadalafil to you know start um, reintroducing that and it might be helpful for you he was like I'm absolutely not fussed about that I was like oh yeah <laughs> so, but and that is when you because I mean Tadalafil is very protective for various other reasons because it's actually helping uh, reduce vascular inflammation which is one of the mechanisms by which it helps improve uh, uh, erectile function Um and so from if you've got somebody with vascular inflammation, which is impairing erectile function, actually from a cardio protective and a sort of a, a vascular health point of view is going to be positive regardless. And so me with Dr. Mind on is going, ah, this is what you need. And it's like, no, thank you. <laughs> Not interested at all until you've increased the testosterone levels enough that the libido has improved. Yeah. OK. So, yeah. And then um, things like testicular atrophy. So ball shrinkage mm -hmm. for those who uh, don't know what I'm talking about. Yep, yep. Um, is that something you typically see? Um, you know, so obviously it's it's fairly prevalent i think with steroid users but yep. for for these normal chaps who are just declining is that something is that a potential symptom sign as well so it can be um often it happens so slowly they won't necessarily notice it it can be something that they notice after they have started taking testosterone um there are various there were sometimes people take hcg to help preserve What's testicular HGD, volume sorry? human chorionic gonadotrophin mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to say but yeah so that basically um, helps maintain testicular function and testicular creation of testosterone and sperm so um, some guys choose to take it for um, uh, maintenance of fertility mm. because it's helping you create your own, uh, maintain uh, creating your own sperm um, and it also uh, m you know we know that it helps maintain your own testosterone levels as well um, so it maintains your own endogenous testosterone yeah. so which yeah. is um, you know for a lot of people really important yeah okay great and then um, yeah the other one I was going to mention was fertility so that I guess goes hand in hand doesn't mm. it is it yeah. a symptom yeah um, to summarise then so uh, obviously mental health and, and depression yeah. that, that covers like a huge yeah. huge number of, of different things so we'll, we'll kind of keep that under that umbrella and then you've got the erectile dysfunction yeah. uh, the libido um, concentration mental focus I yeah, think okay. so So I mean yeah it's kind of slightly outside the standard mental health bracket but concentra concentration and mental focus I think are really uh, the term brain fog I was about to say is, brain fog. yeah yeah, and it's used a lot in in women's HRT yeah. cycle as well. You know, it's and it's really interesting how similar, you know, it's obvious really, but um, how similar the two sort of processes are, apart from the. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that women who are going through the menopause might develop more sort of 
anxiety related symptoms from a mental health point of view sometimes they get a bit low and a bit depressed alongside it but it from my experience um of uh, helping women who are struggling with the menopause um i haven't seen quite so much of the the typical picture the typical men's health picture for me with testosterone deficiency is apathy social withdrawal and feeling down and flat and low um whereas uh, it doesn't seem to be represented so similarly with women um, yeah. in that front. Yeah, okay. Um, and then, of course, there was a nice west and then the um, sort of osteoporosis process that we mentioned. Mm. So they're, they're, they're the major ones then. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, bone density stuff. Yeah, all right, perfect. All right, so, so yeah, I guess, how do we fix it? So what's the treatment? Um, so obviously lifestyle stuff we've yeah. spoken um, we've spoken about so so should, should we should we maybe um, take this opportunity to talk about the, I guess the two different types of approach so you've got the testosterone replacement therapy yeah. and testosterone optimization therapy do you look at those two yeah, things like so as separate approaches or do they just um, so they need to go hand in hand yeah. um, I think there, there, so there'll be certain guys out there who will be look, who'll be hearing testosterone optimization. That's not what I hear, um, and actually optimization with a Z that the Americans will describe it as is um, uh, might not necessarily be treating a deficiency that we would describe in the UK, but they might be just saying if you have more testosterone, then this will make you feel. Mm -hmm better and right. you'll be able to lift more and you'll be able to you have better energy etc um so optimization of your of your health once you're optimizing your testosterone which i think is what um you're um discussing there mm. uh yes i think you know there obviously some of the lifestyle things that we talk about um but the the treatments for um replacing your testosterone um is that what you were implying for the, yeah. yeah? Yeah, so so I guess, yeah, there's probably three things actually now you've said that I was okay. thinking about because <laughs> the optimization was around the lifestyle coaching more. Okay, yeah. Um, and then the replacement was then yeah. providing the, the extra testosterone. Yeah. But now you've mentioned that it's a really good point around actually the treatment of deficiency through extra testosterone will also yeah. be optimizing yeah. of testosterone levels through endogenous testosterone as well. Yeah. Because that's something that... Um, you know, I, I feel in the UK is, is where it, it looks like, again, we're different to the US. Mm -hmm. We're in the UK that there are you know, options for people to to correct deficiency. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, someone like me who's 40, um, not necessarily symptomatic, mm -hmm. um, but actually would like to feel like I did when I was 30. Mm -hmm. I feel like that, that for me to achieve, that's quite difficult. And you yeah. might tell me well, through, through through the NHS. Uh, well, no, no, everything's no, difficult for the NHS. But even through like private practice, okay. I feel like that's considered uneth not unethical. But you know, it's not common practice to go. Actually, you're in a normal range. You're not symptomatic. Mm. Therefore, we're not going to give you any yeah I'll see extra that. testosterone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I think is I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm. Uh, UK based doctor so I'm going to have grown up within the culture of that but for, for me personally I kind of feel like actually by taking testosterone replacement therapy it's not an on the bus off the bus type of thing like it's a commitment for life mm. um, and I think unless you are correcting a health deficit I believe that it's quite irresponsible in some ways of a clinician to essentially consign you to a lifestyle of dependence on a medication yeah, okay um and i think i feel like that's that's quite an important thing to bring out because potentially we could down regulate your own testosterone um and then that's it and actually you sitting here right now could be like yeah i can afford this this will be fine but 72 year old you might not <laughs> or in four year old's time, like there might be some hideous life event that means that you end up in a NHS hospital and they stop giving you that treatment mm. and then you come out and you can't work and pay for said treatment. Yeah. And we never really know what's coming around the corner. Yeah. But actually, you as you are, it could be that we're thinking, Well, hang on a second, why do you feel like you need that to be, you know, optimized? Mm. Maybe there's a mindset change that we need to be thinking about mm. that you aren't as you need to be right now. Um, and I think there's, there's a sort of a bigger 
question about the responsibility of the clinician, the prescribing clinician, to know whether or not um, that's the most appropriate thing for somebody to consign them to that life. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. And that was one of the questions which, which was, is it for life? And yeah, it obviously is. Um, and yeah, it, it's such a good point, I think, because obviously it is, you know, for a private clinic, um, in most cases, unless you've got a really forward thinking educate NHS GP, which is unlikely in regard to this area, I mean. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something to consider, isn't it, I think. Mm. But equally, you know, good point that if, you know, anybody is thinking that they like to feel more optimised, then mm. maybe that's because they're feeling less optimised. Mm. There they might be some be. other stuff going on. Yeah. yeah. All right, fine. Okay, so that's American optimization, British optimization <laughs> covered, S and Z. Um, so in right. regard to kind of, you know, testosterone replacement therapy then, so someone comes into your clinic, mm -hmm. they're symptomatic, um, what's the first thing that you would do with them? So um, we'd find out about their bloods. Um, we would give them a full MOT um, with regards to blood. So we'd be looking at a full blood count. Um, we'd be looking for any anemia um, and we'd be looking at hematocrit levels. We'd be looking at any signs of infection or chronic infection or anything. Uh, we'd be looking at kidney function, thyroid function, cholesterol levels. We'd be looking at HbA1c, which is looking at insulin sensitivity. Um, and we'd probably also look at vitamin D levels as well because there's a weird amount of vitamin D deficiency mm. going on. Yeah, it's because we're all stuck <laughs> in room. We're all That's sat why. in yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That and the fucking grey skies yeah. of England. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, where is the sun? Anyway, um, and I guess we should probably look at hormone levels or people would be wanting a refund. Mm -hmm. So um, we'd look at all of those things and we take those uh, bloods fasted in the morning between 7 and 11 and then I'd before starting treatment I'd want to look at two samples um, most two samples definitely looking at free testosterone total testosterone and the FSH and luteinizing hormone um, and we want to do that because there are loads of variables I mentioned before. You know, we could take it three times in a day and they'd look wildly different. You could paint a different picture of different different people. Um, and I'd want to take a pretty thorough history, history about whether or not you just got in over any chronic disease, chronic illnesses or, you know, or injuries or whatever. And what medications you've been taking recently as well, just to check that there wasn't anything on the list that was going to um, make a difference. But... Often, though, guys will have come to me and was like, I get the occasional spreadsheet. I'm like, I'll get, I love a spreadsheet. <laughs> and it'll be like 10 years worth of, of uh, blood tests that have been taken from various institutions. So mm. often, it's, I've already got the answers when yeah. people come in. Yeah. And do you have uh, access to like uh, sort of the medical records and stuff? So, no, I don't, which is why it's really important for me to communicate with their GPs um, and to make sure that their GPs are aware of any treatment that we start together. Um, so what I do say to patients are if they've had um, blood tests done through their GPs, then can they provide them? Um, but more and more I'm seeing guys that come in and ping over their Medichecks tests and things like that as well but I also do bloods in the clinic anyway so I get to see them first hand so. yeah and do you ever um, bump heads with GPs when you're treating their patients do you ever get any pushback um I've had questions I've had phone calls but I always whenever I write to them I like like I said it just goes back to they're just doctors who started off in the same place and who are you know still wanting to do a really good job by their patients yeah. um who may have different levels of understanding of it um and i've been really privileged to have some experts give me a lot of really really kind mentored advice and take me from zero to you know being quite comfortable in the field um and actually often if they do call or say can we talk? I'm always like, oh God. <laughs> but often they're just interested yeah. and they want to know. They want to know more. They're like, yeah, we're getting more of these people. And the beginning end of the conversation might sound a bit frustrated, but usually by the end of it, it's like, ah, oh, that's really fascinating. And sometimes they get invited into their practice to go and have a chat with the practice and talk to them, which I love mm. because um, even if it just means that one of the GPs in there are like, 
yeah, this sounds really interesting. I'm going to check a few levels. Yeah. That makes me very excited. Disproportionately so. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, um, I, I mentioned on the way in that a, a, a friend of the family were around recently, who's mm. a GP, and um, they'll, they'll probably watch this episode, so I won't mention names, but I hope they don't mind me saying. Um, but they were really interested in this episode. And, yeah. and when I mentioned it was around TRT, yeah. they naturally thought it was to do with uh, sort of transitioning someone's gender. Mm. Um and then I mentioned it was about male deficiency and they then assumed it was must be athletes or steroid users. Yeah. So they were, yeah, kind of quite sort of fascinated by this prospect of, yeah. of this topic. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and I, and I, I talked about, I talked briefly about the link between it and, and depression and then they were like, wow, like I'd never even thought about yeah. that. I'd, I'd never would have thought to test testosterone. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. That's good that yeah. they're, they're kind of open-minded and, and looking to. Yeah, to, absolutely. And like I said, like a lot of the time, I think sometimes it can be, it can be really challenging when you've got a 10 minute consultation, yeah. you've seen 25 people in the day and someone comes into you sounding quite informed but with a clear agenda mm. and there's nothing more uncomfortable as a doctor than someone coming in with more information than you with an agenda it can put you on the back seat a little bit make yeah. you feel a little bit uncomfortable we are not brilliant at being the person in the room who knows least about what's being talked about mm. when you've got to crack through a 10 minute consultation <laughs> and we are a little bit more comfortable in our own skin when <laughs> when we feel like we know more than the other person in the room which often you know um can make us feel a bit less comfortable and it's really hard in current um nhs gp practice to be able to go do you know what i'll i'll get back to you yeah. um let's book in for a 15 minute consultation mm. in a week's yeah. time once I've had some reading time to do yeah, um, that must be really weird though because so. 15, 20 years ago when the internet wasn't around that probably was never a thing you'd yeah. never get a guy like us going in with all this information about yeah. what's going on and just going look boom yeah. <laughs> this is what I know what do you think you know and, and yeah and it's really difficult because the the uh, the bro science stuff that comes mm. up at the same time can be mm. pretty bamboozling in itself uh, <laughs> So I called them for more place, more dates in there. And they're like, what? I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think I think some of I think some of those uh, situations must be really, really challenging. Yeah. And they've got a hell of a lot on their plate with such Huge, crappy really. resources yeah. at the moment. So um, yeah, I yeah. know we've been a bit loose lipped about GPs. No, but they, I get they do it. do it, amazing it, jobs, and you know. and I, th I I all equally like understand the frustration. It's not. It's, no. it's the it's the system infrastructure yeah. around them. It's not. Yeah. It's not. It must be one of the worst jobs in the world to be a GP. They need to know. Like a lot about a lot it used to be that people talk to, talk about gps as knowing a little about everything but actually they know a hell of a lot about a hell of a lot and there's a lot of stuff that they won't have been taught about yeah, and yeah. so yeah yeah um so just just staying on that topic for a second yes. um because that that's say you've you've done your bloods you see okay. that someone needs treatment yeah um they're symptomatic everything else yeah um you'll then start a course of treatment um, if that individual were to take, go on to MediChecks, get mm -hmm. their bloods done, get two samples, take it to the doctor um, or to their GP, um, would the GPs, as much as we've already talked about the fact that they, it's maybe not something that's covered in much detail, if, mm -hmm. if any, in, in med training, unless you've got a specialist interest, you might not know. Yeah. If the GP were to see a deficiency in testosterone, mm -hmm. would they know how to treat it? Not necessarily. It would be real specific to the individual. Um, I think sometimes they might refer to endocrinology yeah. and um, that may or may not see treat, uh, treatment. Um, I, you know, I've had uh, guys with t total testosterone of four come back having seen, waited nine months to see an endocrinologist and still have treatment refused. Um, uh, so... No, not necessarily. Yeah. Sometimes they will. Sometimes they'll trial them on um, tester gel, yeah. um, which has, uh, or sort of, a, that's a transdermally absorbed testosterone, um, which is usually based in the the tester gel is an alcohol based testosterone. Um, the difficulty with transdermally absorbed um, gels are that they have varying um, absorption. Um, and different people will absorb different amounts just because that's how our skin is set up um, and 
the next step up from that is usually for the majority of the GPs, not all, but the majority of GPs, that uh, there will be an endocrinology referral. Yeah. Um, but that can take ages. And yeah. I think by the time you've got to that stage, a lot of the time you just want to, just want it fixed. Yeah. Now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's that, it's that waiting list as well, but... I've yeah. also just heard different stories around sort of the, the, the sort of frequency of dosing and everything mm. else. And um, let's maybe sort of chat about that. So you talked a, a little bit about the gels and yeah. um, and there's obviously injectable option as well. Yeah. So so we've got we've got somebody who definitely needs it um, and you're you're looking to start a course of treatment. Yeah. So talk us through what that would look like typically for somebody. So um, the on license uh, treatments in the UK are like I said the gels um, and by, but when I say on license it means that the medication has a license for that indication for that specific indication so there are other testosterone treatments who have been uh, that have been tested and are known to be safe but not specifically licensed for that indication so um, obviously we spoke about uh, Testogel the other unlicensed medication for testosterone deficiency in the UK is Nibido or testosterone undecanoate um, which is a um, very long lasting uh, treatment which is given as an intramuscular injection into the glute um, it's a 4 mil um, injection which is quite high volume um, so it has to be given over uh, it's suspended in oil so it has to be given over a, and it's recommended a 90 second to 120 second duration so it's quite a long chat while that goes in <laughs> of distraction <laughs> yeah yeah um, so and it's a it's a large volume as well so people find it quite uncomfortable um and some people say that they don't really feel much different for the first few weeks and then they get a good middle few weeks they get excited about things and then it it sort of drops off in its if it in its efficacy there are some people who who get positive results from it um but the uh thing that a lot of chaps say that they've read on forums is that there are people who get good uh uh good positive results from that those two treatments are sort of few and far between they don't tend to they don't tend to get many popularity rankings in the forums so that's one of the things that you, and how often would that be done every week so every no so the the nibido injection is between every eight to 12 weeks just one injection every eight to 12 weeks yeah that's completely different to what gym rats for well because they all talk about micro dosing yeah. don't they I yeah that's what i was going to say yeah, yeah. They, like take test cyprianate and they micro dose it on a monday tuesday yeah. thursday friday and then like you know so yeah, so so testosterone cypionate is um, one of the medications that's off license. Um, it is increasing in um, uh, its popularity, I suppose I'd say. Um, and it, microdosing is mm, it's not really <laughs> the most. When you talk about microdosing, you'd be talking about an overall dose of it, mm -hmm. i.e. what you'd be taking on a weekly basis, being lower, I would assume, that it would sound like it would be, so, the yeah, total would dose would like be lower. Week, but actually what you're doing is just taking smaller doses more frequently. And the benefit of doing that can be that you don't see the spikes of estrogen and the spikes of hematocrit. And that can be one of the one of the sort of reasons why people take smaller doses more frequently but the overall dose that you're taking as a general rule is about what you would have been taking if you weren't if you were taking it more yeah. frequently yeah, yeah, I, know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just confused myself mid-sentence no. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah so um cypionate tends to be something that's taken subcutaneously some people take it intramuscularly um but yeah, it, it's reasonably well tolerated. Um, it's very low. It tends to be uh, given um, at quite low volumes, again, which makes it more comfortable to be taken. Yeah. Um, and so people generally tolerate it pretty well. Um, so, yeah, it, it tends to be one of the... Because it's uh, subcutaneous, it generally is... Uh, People say it's more comfortable than an intramuscular injection. That usually given with a slightly larger bore needle, but not much. Mm. Yeah, nice. um, and then there's potentially the, one of the other unlicensed medications, but tends to only really be um, on the NHS side of things, only be um, 
administered or prescribed by endocrinologist is sustenon. So it's uh, unlikely to be started off certainly in primary care. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sustenon, which is a blend of four different esters with varying yeah. half-lives, it tends to be given as an intramuscular injection. Um, and the NHS way that I've seen it prescribed is an injection every three or two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. Um Whereas certainly what you see more in the men's in the private men's health clinics is it be broken down into sort of a twice a week, two or three times a week dose yeah. as an intramuscular injection. So why is the NHS different? Is it through the through it's, so it's, they have to go by certain studies that are maybe a bit outdated or? I don't know. I'm not certain. It's endocrinology. It's endocrinology uh tends to be prescribed more by endocrinology. Uh as opposed to uh, andrologists or urologists or GPs that have got a special interest in sexual medicine. Uh, but I'm not really that sure about what the difference is. I don't know what, I haven't really seen much. I haven't, from my reading, managed to gather much of an evidence base for why you would do it for yeah. that time period. All right, so yeah, you got the injectables or you got the, the gel. Yeah. Um, and then we, we kind of touched already a couple of times around, you know, some of the, um, I guess, thought of side effects of taking tests. And I think a lot of these are associated with um, probably illegal use of, st- of testosterone. Um, but some of the things that obviously get talked about, so there's obviously heart disease, hair loss, fertility, um, and again, ball shrinkage. Moves. Yeah, that one too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So how, how do you typically mitigate those in, in practice when you're treating? So dose is key. Um, so super physiological, i.e. higher than is nat- would naturally be found or sub-physiological, we've already established, are the ones that, really, uh, that sort of um, do bad things, essentially. Um, and equally, your testosterone levels go up and down during a day. So... Um, and you're going to get your estrogenic symptoms when you have big dumps of estrogen, potentially, mm-hmm. sometimes. Now, that's only really going to, that usually only happens if you've got a higher body fat percentage, which is why sometimes we try, and I say try, to correct that prior to starting testosterone replacement therapy. Um, Sometimes it doesn't work because your metabolism is already dysregulated dysreg- if you if you're struggling with a higher body fat percentage, and you've also got the mental health side of things, which is sometimes you lose them if you don't try and help correct part of the testosterone mm-hmm. um, side of things as first. But equally, you have to make sure it's safe, so you're not putting them if they've got um, a high body fat percentage. You need to make sure that you're not putting them at risk if of dyslipidemia so uh, disrupted cholesterol and um, raised uh, blood pressure and putting the, giving them other risk factors because actually yes it's all very well saying put them on testosterone because it will make them better but actually if they've already got so many risk factors mm-hmm. sometimes you need to correct the risk factors first mm-hmm. um, you can sometimes do them at the same time mm-hmm. uh, or you can start off and say, okay, fine, well, let's goal set here. Your BMI is this. We can try and introduce uh, some azempic potentially to help them lose a little bit of weight. Um, so azempic or semaglutide is a medication that the NHS are actually using uh, in, uh, I think it has to be uh, hospital-led consultants mm-hmm. to help increase insulin sensitivity, uh, reduces appetite and makes them, makes people feel fuller for longer. Um, but it can be prescribed again on the private side to help people achieve weight loss. Um, that said, it needs to be done in a way that essentially you're helping to um, establish an understanding about why their relationship with food has got them into the body habitus that they're in so that you can help correct them and help them develop a more positive relationship with food and move forward. Otherwise, you're just Don't giving you medication and you're not learning. As soon as you come off the medication, there's no, there's not been a positive uh, process that has helped establish mm. better sort of health habits. Yeah. 
it's having that relationship with food long term isn't it that really helps us yeah. all yeah. you know a, a five minute drug that gets it off and then they push yeah, it back on yeah exactly you know? and I think sometimes by the time people have put on that much weight often they will be um eating because they're feeling sad Mm -hmm. and if you put if they then go on a diet they're associating dieting and weight loss with pain of you know with being miserable because they're on a diet and they're Mm -hmm. denying themselves um the positive reinforcement of food so whereas actually if you start breaking that feedback cycle where you say actually you're now celebrating that salad because you're happy about the fact that it's helping you get closer to your goals Mm -hmm. um and they can genuinely do that with the Zen because often they don't feel hungry. So they're not having that constant gnawing of feeling miserable because they're not, um, uh, they're not feeling, yeah. So it's, it's a really, really useful tool. Um, and it can be really useful for reducing some of the risk factors before you start testosterone replacement therapy. And also seeing, like, starting that really positive step of the journey. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, perfect. Mm. Um so yeah, it really sounds like a lot of these side effects then, you know, uh, would happen as a result of long dosage, taking God knows what online, um, yeah. and maybe not tackling some of the, the health risks before you start. Yeah, absolutely. And also not going into it with eyes wide open, like, you know, informed consent is a big deal here. You need to know what your risk factors are, where they lie, short term, long term, um, and that managing that uncertainty of time frames. Mm-hmm. Um, but also getting that this is testosterone. The testosterone part of it is only part of the solution. Um, But it's also really exciting. Like I want people to walk out of the room going, this could be it. Mm, This could be, yeah, Yeah. this is, is, it sounds cheesy, but this could be the beginning of the rest of your life where actually shit gets better, a lot better. Um, And they're their own driving force because it's empowering them to get a hold of all the shit in their life that isn't really where it needs to be right now because like it may not all be about the testosterone but it can be that change that beginning step yeah yeah so it's um yeah it's it's real it's an area that i've become i've really begun to love more and more and just watching guys the awesome things that they go out and achieve mm. once they've just been given a little nudge and they then go out and you know make some pretty amazing changes in their lives it's really cool to see yeah it sounds it sounds it and um we've talked loads like the, the theme throughout this entire podcast i mean what are we on now like i think you're episode 13 or 14 um well don't make me 13 jesus <laughs> guys <laughs> don't worry it's not a friday it's fine right, right. <laughs> it was out on a monday you go. um but yeah i mean the theme is about trying to sort of inform guys inspire guys to maybe level up and self-develop and improve their situation um you know and we've talked a couple of times that obviously there are sort of um medically diagnosed sort of mental health conditions that some people do have and need to be treated by you know sort of medical professionals but then there's there's others who don't have a clear diagnosis and are just you know down in the dumps and depressed and you know to somewhat you know they're, they're our target audience aren't they and they're, they're the, the guys that we're saying to like get your ass out of bed and go to the gym but it's interesting to hear from you that actually there may actually be something underlying that that's maybe not you know mental health related as such but is sort of causing them to to maybe have that lack of motivation but but they probably think they have got depression or they have got something else when you know they may not actually have that but but i mean but what is depression do you know what i mean and you kind of wonder sorry that just went like weirdly philosophical there didn't it but you kind of (laughs) wonder what like how many people who have been treated with these SSRIs for so long, like how many guys who are sadly, you know, not around to tell the tale have actually had testosterone deficiency. Mm -hmm. Um, Because actually a lot of the people that I think back, and this is one of these like horrible sort of moments where anything back and you just think, God, how many people have I missed that actually this might have been their reason. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's an it's it's a question to ask, but you don't we don't I don't think we'll ever really know. Mm. But I can't tell you many guys that I've treated with an antidepressant that's come skipping back into my room six months later. But you've had people that have had testosterone replacement therapy coming in back in fine. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Life, really. Yeah, um, yeah. Play, play, playing devil's advocate, um, have you have you treated men and it's not worked? I have treated men and they'd had a bumpy first three months yeah. uh, with regards to anxiety, mm-hmm. uh, with regards to just being a bit emotionally incontinent for a bit, mm-hmm. um, for want of a better phrase, a bit tearful, a bit um, tetchy. Um, don't know what that's about, but it happens. It's usually the f- first two, maybe three month window. If there's going to be a bumpy time, that's it. Yeah. Um and then it tends to level out and they tend to level out and they can be, they can say that they'll be greeted with like bigger life events and things that would stress them out before and just feel a bit more of a sense of control over it. Um, that's a really common thing. And they can, they'll still feel upset about things and sad about things, but steadier, mm. um, which is interesting yeah uh, there'd be some interesting functional mri to do there but mm. yeah it's uh, yeah. Really yeah. fascinating seeing all these different types of blokes and people coming in and, and seeing how they react and how they change and then thinking about what you can maybe do different and you know maybe yeah well i mean even just eye contact body language uh like joking yeah. like coming yeah. back in with a bit more like banter it's like you were dull last time so <laughs> none of you none of you you've all been great <laughs> but yeah they were do you want about me on that podcast I'm like nah <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't you I promise um, but yeah and just sort of seeing seeing those changes is really heartening because that's what I'm getting in a consultation room and just being their doc but actually um just just friends and friendships being redeveloped and everything mm. and you know people are like yeah my mates will be like oh you're back <laughs> uh, which is just really lovely to see yeah what's the youngest person you've treated I keep saying person what's the youngest bloke you've treated uh, yeah, that's very, very gender neutral of you. But, <laughs> but yeah. Don't worry about charity. Um, a, oh, I think he was 22. Wow. Mm. Steroid user or no, natural? No. Um, he had test, it's quite significant testicular trauma. Okay. In a motorway crash. Right. Mm. Yeah, that'd do it. Um, yes. Mm. And, yeah. Yeah, but he did really well. Yeah. And is still doing really well. And that's one of the other things. Um, with the guys who are a bit older than him, like they'll often say that they continue to see improvements for like like they keep going years down the line. They're mm. like, Oh yeah, and this yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, which is really it good. Must to be see. quite nice as well seeing um seeing probably blocks in their forties lose loads of weight get this like mm. pizzazz back and then they probably look like a different person yeah. rather mm. than being this old, you know, kind of looking, Withered. being 40 and looking yeah. 55, yeah. you know, they, they start like rolling back the years essentially. I think a lot of the time as well, it's interesting seeing what people's concerns were early on and it was like, oh, but I don't like needles. It's like, Nobody ever mentions being bothered about needles like six months in. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, occasionally people switch from IM to subcutaneous or whatever, but, um, it, or the expense as well of TRT um, is often something that people are understandably. How expensive is, is TRT? Yeah, good question. Um, depends on the treatment, but it can be from the medication itself, as little as £15 a month to, I mean, um, depending on the doses, the gels can actually be quite expensive. Can be sort of that, 80, 90 got, pounds. My clients um, are going through the menopause and they have mm. the little test gels that they yeah. get uh, through private clinics. Yeah. They always say that's the most expensive bit sometimes yeah. if they need a little bit of test gel. Yeah, but like Sipi and 8 could be sort of 45 to 65 pounds a month. HCG makes things a bit more expensive. Um, so if you're trying to maintain fertility, um, uh, it's not a huge amounts, though, is it? It's not huge. No, like, I, no. I wouldn't say anything that you just said is unaffordable to 
an average man would you say that's the right thing to say you know i wouldn't say that was unaffordable if you could budget that in to make I yourself feel a million times better look at thinking about the ancillary stuff it's it's um you know you're, you're also adding in your needles and syringes and you know um but also the other bit that the the expensive bit is the initial bit because you're having your initial consultation um and you're having your blood tests and the blood tests are more regular at the beginning while we're getting you on your dose and everything um and so that you know you'll have blood tests at one month three months and six months for example and then after that once you're ready um you know you could be just having blood tests once every six months um but that that's the the difficult bit um if you then need dose changes i always do a blood test of sort of a six weeks after the dose change or whatever um so they don't you know want to up and running it's not so bad that the thing that guys always say to me well a lot of the time I'll, I'll hear later on down the line is my productivity at work is so much better that more money anyway mm. yeah, it pays for itself yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. can actually get her best we always do well with personal training as well yeah. <laughs> one of the first things we tell people is right stop drinking stop the takeaways yeah that's going to save you like under a quid a week so yeah. that's it yeah. pay for. You, you can yeah. pay the 25 pounds <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah exactly Sorted. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, I had a couple of just last questions, um, and this may not be a, your area of expertise at all. So tell me to shut up if you want. Um, in regard to invite. <laughs> <laughs> in regard to uh, you're not the first person I said that. On the I need to frame my questions differently. I think. Um, in regard to, I guess, uh, sort of comorbidities, multimorbidities, diseases. Um, are there like the diagnosis uh, or diagnosed diseases that means that you can't treat or people can't take TRT? Can't. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. So um, active testicular cancer. Okay. Um, active malignancies, like you just wouldn't want to. They yeah. probably have other things uh, to focus on. Um, but there also would be an, there'd be a potential risk for testosterone to have an have an impact a uh, negative impact on those so that'd be something we're thinking about um you would look at caution in people who had polycythemia so um raised uh raised hematocrit and raised red blood cells before starting treatment you'd want to know why and yeah. you, you potentially would want to investigate uh, well you'd want to know if somebody had a, ra a significantly raised um, prolactin beforehand as well, just because you might be thinking about whether or not they had a, um, a pituitary adenoma as well. So you'd want to know about causes. And you would also be wanting to have a think about somebody who said that they had active sleep apnea that wasn't being treated okay. um, because that could just put you at a slightly increased, well, yeah. put you at an increased risk. That's usually if they're overweight, I imagine, this, yeah. wouldn't it? So you'd initially try and get their weight down anyway, which would kind of fix the sleep apnea. Yeah. And and there you're in your sort of motivational interviewing <laughs> moment. <laughs> Yeah, the prolactin, that, that goes back to your, um, what you're saying around the, the controls of, of blood testing as well, because I know that can um, that can spike after certain uh, activities, I think. Yeah, it? I mean, your prolactin can, like, you could get stressed on the way to your blood test and your prolactin can zoom up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you'd be looking at your big picture and doing the GP thing of, well, repeat that test. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that next yeah. time it's not looking so concerning. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> and then uh, just on that, and this was the bit I was referencing more when I, I, I thought it might not be your area of expertise, but mm. specifically with um, something like prostate cancer, mm -hmm. where men have gone through like androgen deprivation therapy, yeah. obviously the side effects uh, exactly what we've talked about because it's almost yeah. like a, you're almost medically um, castrating people, aren't you? Essentially, yeah. Is that something that could be treated through TRT? So there, this is it's interesting actually. So there have been more recent studies have said post prostatectomy when you have been sure that you've got the all clear that there's no other active malignancy going on mm -hmm. there is a potential role for testosterone replacement therapy after that okay um yeah and i think it's something that you'd want to do in conjunction with their either urologist or oncologist depending on who they're being managed by mm -hmm. at that stage um but it would be it wouldn't be ruled out and off the table now yeah okay. um, would age come into that because obviously, you know, if they're 75, I don't know, not in great health. I don't, I don't, I mean, 
I don't know that it would... I mean, it would obviously form part of the question, I suppose, but... I'm only asking because one of my clients has just had prostate cancer and he's he's recovered. He's 70, 74. Yeah, is he on ADT? Yeah, I think so. So again, it's one of those that he's he's been feeling like shit since he's, you know, he's got the all clear mm. and it's all good. But since he's come back, he's not quite the same. You know, yeah. his energy levels are not quite the same, mm. obviously, because what he's been through, yeah. whatever, which is kind of normal. Yeah. But I was just and interested then to say, like, you know, might be worth you going to speak. Yeah. Well, no, it was interesting because I was actually... Um, in a clinic with a urologist who was looking after some of these individuals um, and he was a professor in urology and was quite comfortable in treating these patients Um, it would definitely be a consultation with the hospital specialist to know that everything was absolutely clear um but some of these people some of these people actually do really well just on some of the gels because actually the margin of increase that they these older guys need to feel sometimes is uh significantly less so actually a lower dose gel um can do them quite well Yeah. yeah Um, but it's it's just making sure that you know you need to make sure that they're as safe as they possibly can be before you do treatment like that. Yeah, no, it was just it was a it was a population that I'm mm. a little familiar with with my with my other job. But um, yeah, yeah, I thought I'd ask because I knew that was a, a, quite a severe side effect of that mm. particular treatment was the, essentially the symptoms we've talked yeah. about. All right, amazing. Um, so yeah, I think one thing that we touched on very briefly that I'll just maybe sort of start start the close out with was around just when to get your testosterone checked because we mentioned it I think briefly um a while back where obviously we've talked in lot lots around symptoms. Yeah. But you also touched on like, you know, sort of the importance of baseline testing as well. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, one of the questions was, you know, when should guys get their test checked? Um, even if they're non symptom or asymptomatic yeah. and don't have symptoms. Would you recommend they do it when they like hit 30 or is there a certain age that you should get that baseline so that when you are 40 and maybe feel a bit different, you've got that reference point? I, I think, and this is my personal opinion more than anything else, because certainly can reference it anywhere. But I think in a world where we don't have a good reference range, um, I think that it isn't a bad idea to know what good looks like. Um, that's not to say that you're always going to be replaced to that level, but I think it would be, even if you're feeling good, I don't think it's a bad time to do an MOT and have a look in. We've got the opportunity to. Maybe don't go to your GP asking for that. If you're going to do that, then do. It's worth something doing something via, you know, any of the good, like you get the online home test kits and everything. Um, but I think it's worth just being aware of the symptoms, um, you know. But I think... And, and you know testing if any of those symptoms do become apparent to you but I think a healthy this is what good looks like to me blood test at some point in your life isn't a bad thing to have done I really don't um, and while where normal values may not be normal why not yeah. equip yourself with what normal might look like to you but just make sure you do it at the right time in the day so that it's a meaningful (laughs) (laughs) it's a meaningful result the the blood tests that they do online you know the kits that you can get from online are they okay to use just as a yeah you get some yeah you get some good ones um i think uh free testosterone and total testosterone are useful um some of the the grouped uh, blood testing, the sort of the well man tests, can be quite good uh, because they do look at uh, some of the other markers, including some of your vitamin levels and everything as well. Um, and having a look in at your own lipid profile can be a good thing. Make sure if you're doing lipid profiles, you're doing fasted though, because otherwise you can scare yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The roof. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. All right. Amazing. Perfect. Um, any more questions from you, your man? No, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, that's no, brilliant. I loved it. Um, so I guess finally it, it, we'll, we'll put your um, your website in the description ah, thank um, you. and your services you offer are both online and face to face yeah so yeah I do uh, remote video consultations and face to face in Plymouth City Centre yeah amazing well yeah I think uh, as we've said uh, I think any guys suffering any of the symptoms we've talked about or just looking to get a baseline for future reference should definitely um, think about getting their testosterone levels checked and mm. maybe come and see you yeah awesome yeah, thank you for coming on appreciate Thanks it for having me on <laughs> cheers guys <laughs>